Welcome to Risks and Trends, an annual Politica Insight conference. This year, due to pandemic unpredictability, we've decided to organize it in a studio without the audiences. In 10 thematic blocks, together with our friends, partners and guests, we've tried to show the world as we see it. My name is Piotr Żakowiecki. I'm a senior uh, medical analyst at Politica Insight. I would like to invite you to a discussion how to get well after COVID-19. I would like to invite you to watch. Our guest is Dr. Adam Niedzielski, the Minister of Health. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Minister, our conversation will mostly uh, be devoted to the future, but we will start from the current pandemic situation. I wanted to ask you, by way of uh, the introduction, what, in your opinion, is the most important conclusion uh, when it comes comes to the functioning of the health system, what didn't work out well, what needs to be uh, corrected in order to avoid the worst pandemic outcomes this year and in the future. I think that really the pandemic has been a period of intensive learning and uh, surveying what is a bottleneck in our system and uh, one of the key conclusions is that uh, this uh, small number of personnel, uh, I mean both uh, uh, doctors, uh, nurses and medical first responders is the most important thing to handle because uh, as uh, recent months uh, have shown, you can buy equipment, you can uh, construct 10 hospitals, you can add some beds, but the personnel is the crucial element uh, which may become a bottleneck and even if we uh, erect new temp hospitals and we staff it, it will happen at the expense of other elements of the system. So we will neglect uh, some other patients which also negatively impact the public health and also generate the so-called uh, health deficit. So personnel ensuring uh, the right level of staffing and also proper conditions so that they can uh, focus only on um, uh, treatment rather than uh, thinking about uh, material position or salaries. I think that arranging these two elements is uh, the most strategic challenge in terms of the longest uh, time horizon because it is impossible within one term of a minister to straighten out things which have been neglected for many, many years. Uh, in the 90s, we've seen the reduction of the number of future doctors being educated at the universities, which is now a problem. Well, it is a quite a depressing conclusion given that, uh, that the structural constraints are difficult to mend in a short term. One of the elements that you've raised, uh, the working conditions and also relieving the medical personnel with certain competencies uh, from tasks which are menial and repetitive is also a path that uh, the medical self-government uh, organizations are pointing to. Do you have any plans how to unleash and relieve this medical human resources? Well, we have some plans uh, and they've been around for a while. They've been implement, implement, implementing the whole digitization of, for example, uh, issuing e-referrals, uh, e, um, recipes, uh, reduces also the red tape and bureaucracy because uh, uh, these electronic documents um, uh, replace uh, the written documentation and we're also at a criti critical juncture that quite often just like at the very beginning of introducing various, various electronic instruments uh, it means a double work and that's why we hear some voices that maybe right now the digitization is an additional burden but 
about uh, the end goal is in sight. It is a prospect of a few months or a year to see some benefits uh, from reduction of the red tape. But it is not only this element because uh, we also have the assistance to doctors, this is a new profession which is not very popular, an assistant to the medical doctor. And uh, the idea is to relieve the doctors from the bureaucratic activities. And finally, and I think this is one of the most strategic uh, notions, uh, to uh, reconstruct the pyramid of medical services, which would mean that the uh, treatment should be happening at the lower level of this pyramid of medical services. And when I refer to the pyramid, I'm referring to a structure when we have uh, at the base primary health care, then outpatient clinic, and finally the hospital. And in Poland, we have the reverse pyramid because uh, our system is mostly based on hospitals and this process uh, of uh, guiding a patient through the system to uh, subsequent levels which should be consulting steps uh, is not working properly and there is a lot of work to do and I think this is a dominant um, direction of the reform of the medical service in the coming years but here, contrary to the shortages of personnel, here I think that the effect may be achieved faster within two or three years, so that um, within this uh, minister's uh, term you can see some tangible uh, results. Because remember that less doctors in hospitals means um, higher available availability, availability at the level of primary health care and uh, consulting doctors. So when you get to the primary health care, you almost get the consulting of a specialist doctor, because this is quite a problem. Well, this is a complex topic and we could uh, have a, a separate discussion on it. I just wanted to briefly wonder what within these two or three years in terms of uh, reversing the pyramid of services will be the biggest challenge, because you could think about the certain customs of medical uh, personnel, former and former procedures approach of the patients. This is also an, a matter of how this uh, uh, night medical assistant works and uh, how the patients uh, visit the uh, emergency room when it's not necessary. What will be the biggest challenge here? You're right that uh, we should uh, start this uh, conversation, which could probably take 24 hours to cover every angle of it and to have a complete picture. But uh, uh, if we want to create this uh, rational pyramid of medical services in the midterm, I think that at the level of primary health care, and I will also include here night medical assistance. Uh, at this primary health care, we should develop uh, a number of models of coordinated assistance to the patient. So the patient would have specific paths. So, for example, if you have a given illness, then you just start from primary health care and you know what you should do in subsequent steps. And um, uh, probably it should not be the patient who has this knowledge, but a, a doctor at the primary health care who should refer this person to a, a, a consulting doctor or just to uh, approach the consulting doctor himself and on, only following uh, such consultation uh, think about referral to the hospital level. So a priority would be to develop uh, patient paths for a specific health unit. L let me jump in. When we take a look at uh, some uh, announcements about the cardiological or oncological um, care, at the level of uh, specialist doctors, it's probably easier. 
do we have any achievements at the level of primary health care or it is um, it, it, we, we are just starting I think we have a very good program which have been implementing it's called primary health care plus we add plus to everything in Poland recently uh, so this program assumes that a part of, from this active care for their health which is very important because uh, we don't want to, to have a primary health care which is only able to respond to cold or fever we want to actively take care for the patient's health so this uh, POZ uh, plus program is uh, focused on the health balances that the patient is regularly exa exa examined and then there is a certain uh, treatment plan uh, which is being um, developed and apart from that uh, as part of this primary health care plus program we plan that uh, consulting doctors are um, uh, attached to, uh, to, to certain paths. We have uh, a group of specialists who are allocated and in cooperation with uh, primary health care, uh, they are moving this burden to the lower level. So, so this uh, primary health care plus program uh, is being tested right now. Coming back to the systemic uh, thinking, I think that uh, night medical assistance is something that needs to be reformed. We need to uh, move fast in this area. Well, it started when I was still working at the National Health Fund. Uh, we issued a tender for a special uh, digital platform for teleconsultation and it is based on a professional tool where you can where a patient can send uh, his uh, medical data which verify the um, patient's uh, health status uh, including video chat and national health fund will launch this platform which will be the first contact line and then if this med uh, night medical assistant is not able to to uh, deal with it and the patient will be referred to a specific time slot of a night medical uh, assistant uh, he will not have to go to emergency room but uh, using the system that we uh, already use in um, uh, vaccination this called central registry he will have a, a specific time slot allotted to him when it comes to specialist doctors we have two ideas so we are going to remove all the limits when it comes to the access to consulting specialists and here we need to reassess uh, the tariffs which means that uh, proportionally in our system we spent uh, not enough money on the specialist consultations we want to remove any limit so that the clinics are comfortable and they are not afraid that they will run into debts because so far it was a financial risk for them uh, however, the biggest risk, uh, uh, well, uh, unless you want to ask a question, uh, well, um, since you started about the biggest reform, uh, I'm all ears, well, it's all about hospitals. Hospital sector should be the top of this pyramid in order to reform it. We need to change uh, the ownership structure. We cannot have a situation when we have such a dispersed structure. We have 300 powiats, which is the second level of Polish administrative uh, structure. And and every of this uh, uh, powiat has its own uh, health policy. It's not in sync with the rest. When I was at the National Health Fund, I usually saw um, two hospitals which were 20 kilometers apart. Every of these hospitals um, is owned by a different local uh, leader, and even if the doctor, uh, the, the directors are trying to uh, to to to, um, uh, to adjust that one of the hospitals makes surgery and the other is uh, uh, focusing on rehabilitation, they are not able to come to a, uh, to an agreement and they start to compete. Uh, so both, for example, have the surgery wards 
which means that uh, one will try to attract the personnel from the other because uh, they want to increase the range of the services they offer. And uh, this is uh, really unacceptable, not only unacceptable because at first glance it's just illogical, we just don't have such resources. And I'm not referring here to the financial resources, but doctors and nurses. We cannot have a situation that they are working at two locations which are 20 kilometers apart and doing the same thing. And the patients are not getting anything extra from that because the quality in a situation where they both are not specializing in this. We should have a situation that in one hos hospital they do the surgeries and in the other they are focusing on the rehabilitation. And unfortunately, we don't see a lot of such uh, optimization. It can be done only when this structure is not dispersed. Another argument, you could have seen what happened during the pandemics when we needed to um, uh, activate the emergency management, which requires uh, decisions made very quickly. They should be cohesive and they should not be a result of um, quarrel uh, in an unclear situation. I think we are at the dead end because there is no argument to uh, maintain such a dispersed ownership structure. Another aspect, Minister, because for years we've seen this uh, metaphor of um, uh, the bucket which is not tight, a bucket with a hole in it. Uh, I think there are some ways to make this uh, bucket uh, tight, but we still not, not have enough water in this bucket. Uh, recently we had uh, various speculations uh, how much more money we can put into the system, in other words, into this bucket. What is your uh, personal uh, perspective? As a former head of National Health Fund and currently the Ministry of Health, what would be, in your opinion, the most optimal way of financing the system and which would be the sources, uh, how, how it would be most optimal? I think that in terms of uh, finances, uh, our system is structured quite well. However, in the pandemic, the financial stability of the system uh, has been um, maintained uh, despite various complications. The national health system was uh, safe because it had a guarantee of 6% of uh, uh, GDP because it didn't have to wait for subsidies uh, with other stakeholders, but there were all the guarantees in the low, the 6% of GDP. So I don't think that we need to make any revolution here. I think that one of the ways to change it is uh, to develop 6% uh, of GDP, not only on the medical contribution, but also introduce, introducing uh, new uh, taxes, just like sugar tax, which would contribute because it would uh, have a double benefit um, from the health point of view, because on one hand, it limits uh, the health hazardous activities. Uh, we see that uh, this um, uh, very sweet uh, light drinks uh, increased in their prices and it changes the pattern of the consumers. Uh, some of the big companies are moving towards water and moving away from the uh, sweet uh, beverages. It changes the consumption pattern in a positive way. And on the other hand, it gives us an additional um, uh, source of uh, funds which are then spent on treatment. So if I was thinking about financing, I wouldn't change a model. I would be looking for pro-health uh, uh, contributions, which on one hand um, ensure the money and also uh, change the consumer's behavior. But you could also argue that as part of the existing system, you could uh, introduce 
certain tightening instruments. I'm referring to, to for example, a cruz, which is a kind of uh, a social contribution for uh, farmers. Or, uh, other persons who are um, uh, having uh, their business activity and are not paying uh, a lot. Well, yes, I think this is a right idea. Maybe this is not a, a change of a model of financing, but it is more about tightening this existing model. And if we uh, assume a certain social solidarity principle, we need to uh, eliminate the situations when some of the groups uh, are facing uh, proportionately less uh, burdensome uh, contributions. So I think there is still a room to um, tighten the system and to uh, make it more equitable. And I think that from the point of view of the health system, it would uh, improve um, the medical system. Minister, my final question, moving um, forward, if we were to send a postcard from 2030, in a few words, how would you outline the system that uh, we would have constructed if all these uh, activities uh, succeed? 80% of health matters are done at the level of primary health care, which is uh, coordinated very closely with specialist outpatient clinics, and that happens uh, um, uh, at the level of primary health care connected with specialist uh, units. Uh, the hospitals are within a um, network, which is differently profiled. We have uh, leading uh, hospitals which are also characterized with a high quality because this is also a novelty that I would like to introduce so that the information about the quality of treatment and the customer care and also management care are publicly available and comparable and um, this network has a certain elite quality to it which guarantees high level of uh, uh, procedures and uh, the hospitals are um, uh, operating uh, as uh, one day um, uh, clinical centers they are also combined with a longer term health care which is uh, adjusted to the aging society and also to complete uh, this uh, system, uh, more money in the system. Of course, we need to have certain uh, mm, uh, competitive system. Uh, well, Minister, it sounds very well. We are uh, um, keeping our fingers crossed. Thank you very much for this conversation and uh, have a good day. In this session, together with my guests, uh, we will uh, ponder how to get well after COVID-19 uh, from the point of view of health system. The title of our session could be said is quite optimistic and aspirational. At the end of the day, we can hope that uh, the pandemic will come to an end at some point, but when, nobody knows. There is no reason to think that um, SARS-CoV-2 will not stay here for, for good because COVID-19 can become another se seasonal disease. Gloomy scenarios assume uh, continuous mutation of coronavirus, uh, eluding new vaccines and therapies. But it seems that the baseline scenario is uh, uh, herd immunity thanks to vaccination and increasing number of convalescents. At the end of the year, we should reach it. To say that uh, fighting uh, COVID-19 dominated Polish health system is obvious, but we have to start with that and think what we should do next. Over 80,000 excess deaths in 2020 is a uh, tragic toll of coronavirus, but also system deficits. Also the fact that the access to medical health was not uh, right. 
at the right place. I would like us to talk at uh, the key crucial and possible recipes for our recovery and also think about the specters over the system. I invited great um, experts to our panel. Ms. Maria Libura, who is head of teaching and medical assimilation department of Collegium Medicum University in Austin, and also an expert at Analytical Center of Jagiellonian Club. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Dr. Engineer Robert Maldoch, who is the Health and Democracy Institute president. Hello, how are you? Good morning. Also, Dr. Łukasz Jankowski, who is the president of District Medical Chamber in Warsaw. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that we could start in two ways, either take a look at a short horizon or take a wider view how within the coming decade we'll, we will see the challenges to the health system. What can we um, uh, forecast? Of course, the demographic change is a given. The Polish society will start aging quite fast and that would trigger a lot of consequences for uh, public services. I think another great risk is the lack of uh, efficiency in uh, um, health care, which for years uh, have been something that the experts were raising as a um, concerning thing, because we lack the strategic approach, but maybe we are at a threshold of a change. In your opinion, how should we start this planning in the mid-term? Doctor, well, we have to take a look at the uh, environment uh, around us. We are part of this environment. When we take a look how uh, the world leaders and societies, uh, various stakeholders, perceive the coming 10 years, Certainly, uh, a common denominator is a social perspective, not only economy. The situation of patients, uh, their families, uh, societies, and the whole economy uh, has changed as a result of pandemic. So everyone has been posing this question how to get out of it, how to exit. And I think that the answer to this uh, is being prepared, and some of them are ready. At the 7th and 8th uh, of May, in Porto, we'll see a meeting of the leaders of the EU countries, which will be discussing the, the, the situation um, uh, of societies, uh, specific activities, which uh, could... Um, translate European uh, social pillar into specific initiatives at, at a level of every country and also at, at the EU level. At the same time, every participant of this meet, meeting and summit will be talking about challenges and solutions when it comes to uh, aging society. Things that we are familiar with, let me remind you, uh, aging society, uh, disabled persons, uh, chronic patients, who require continuous support, social support, uh, equal and equitable uh, working conditions. These elements are being materialized. We are no longer going to talk that one should do it, that these are some worthy postulates. Uh, it is important. Let's hope that what the European leaders sign as a certain declaration in Porto in the coming May will charter the course in the coming years or decades. That is coupled with the European perspective, new uh, financing and initiatives just like New Deal and uh, moving out, exiting the crisis, but not only at the economic, but even more uh, specifically social uh, level. You mentioned the New Deal and one of the things which uh, struck me in this leaks, uh, because this uh, New Deal has not been uh, announced yet, However, the only new thing that I can see there is uh, an increase of the spending on uh, health. I think one of the leaks was 7%. Within this uh, European context, do we see any new directions that 
could image well we, we need to differentiate between goals and activities so the goal is to increase the healthy lifespan the, the, the goal is the social inclusion and uh, we see various activities in various countries uh, one is increasing the health uh, the efficiency of a uh, health uh, sector but what can uh, appear in Porto uh, will be an attempt to unify all these activities and to adopt certain minimum standards among European countries and trying to find uh, uh, and to undertake initiatives not only of individual countries but also using EU monies uh, uh, EU budget to change the situation of uh, the needy ones, uh, the ill persons uh, when it comes to long-term care or increasing the, the efficiency of the overall system. The fact that all the leaders will take a look and they will express their uh, uh, unified voice on the 7 and 8 May is significant in itself and we, we haven't seen seen anything like, like that since uh, Getterbox Summit. Doctor, I'm referring to um, Dr. Jankowski. From your perspective of the medical self-government, how do you see this coming 10 years? What one should do in order to improve the situation to make sure that in 2030 we are in a better spot than, than, than we are? What just my predecessor said that we have some means to achieve goals and and goals. This is a, an important summary because you mentioned 7%. I remember three years ago when we were talking about 6.8%. Today we are talking about 7% of, of GDP. And the ministry can say that today you say 7, maybe in the future you will want more. But yes, if we want to achieve the goals, which is health, some tangible uh, parameters uh, describing the health, maybe. It is eight or nine, but let's start with what we want to buy for this money, what we want to ensure with this money. How do we uh, envision the health of population and also access to the medical uh, services, uh, but also the number of years in health? So then we will know how much money we need. So today the answer is not 7, 7.2, 7.4. Well, we are suggested here slightly by the European average, but I think the answer should be we need as much as we need in order to achieve uh, the goals. How one could try to get an estimate, of course, a, a problem for years which has not been solved is this uh, basket of guaranteed um, uh, services, medical services, how to structure this basket. There is also some regulatory uh, aspects uh, from your standpoint. Do you see a prospect of such thinking? Is it an important topic for this um, uh, government? Because we all focus on uh, combating coronavirus, but the problems that we've seen at the beginning of the uh, 20th century have not disappeared. Well, in coming years, we will certainly need more money for the health sector because demography uh, is uh, unrelenting. Uh, we know how to diagnose better. We have better equipment, but better laboratory methods, but it is more and more expensive. We live longer, which also means that we need um, um, more access to these services, so the health costs us more and more. And if we couple that with the current situation in the health sector, and I'm referring here to the medical personnel, which because the um, um, pandemic showed that the, the shortage of medical staff is uh, chronic. Uh, we need to start to think how we are using this personnel that we have. Maria, for years you've been very consistent about uh, 
raising the topic of inequalities when it comes to the uh, access to health uh, services. So how could we take a look at these inequalities within this 10-year perspective? Can we uh, assume that the trajectory we are on, to which extent these inequalities are deepening or staying the same, will they be bigger in 2030 or are there any activities which could bridge the gap and limit the inequalities? inequities. What do you think? Well, before I answer this question on equalities, uh, coming back to the main question on the risks, I think that the biggest risk connected with the pandemics is that it will not teach us anything. Since uh, the very beginning, uh, we hear how this pandemic is a prism which focuses all the problems in the health system, not only in Poland, but but uh, across the world, that this is a magnifying glass which is showing what is not working. When we take a look at what are proposed solutions, then what is uh, surprising is that these solutions are identical to what was proposed before the pandemic. So we hear about uh, uh, continuous uh, transform transition towards uh, digitization, um, focusing on aging society, but the language that we use to describe this reality hasn't changed. So on one hand, we see some radical disruptive change um, in the form of pandemic, but on the other hand, it seems we still haven't understood this lesson, we still can use this old language, or there's a hope that this pandemic will be a short episode and we'll be back to the previous development path. Or maybe we are waiting to solve this uncertainty created by the situation. And the same applies to the health inequities and equalities, because how the social policies uh, will be uh, developed cannot be uh, treated as a foregone conclusion when we take a look at previous uh, pandemics. Uh, one thing we don't remember about them, even the uh, Spanish flu, which we still vaguely remember, a bit better than, uh, than contemporary Hong Kong uh, flu. These were all pandemics which impacted uh, health systems and societies, but we no longer remember. We don't. We remember about the wars, but we don't remember about effects of pandemics. And the historians of medicine, which take a look at the social conse consequences of uh, Spanish flu, point to certain paradoxes. For example, in the countries where the medicine was relatively well developed, we saw a turn toward alternative medicine as a result of the Spanish flu and the lack of trust for science because the scientists were trusted more than they were able to come up with solutions. So I'm curious what will happen uh, now. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for vaccinations because if they prove to be futile, this is what can happen. And uh, on, the, on the other hand, in, in China, it was just the opposite. People started to introduce more and more uh, science. So what will happen within 10 years? I don't know. It is difficult to forecast. They can be paradoxical. They may change social approach to medicine or science and may change a trajectory of the development of individual countries. When it comes to inequalities and inequities, what we see right now would point towards better understanding what these equalities are and um, appreciating them. But on the other hand, these inequalities seem to be increasing not only within the countries. In Poland, we could see this phenomenon in the first months when the patients depending on their potential cultural capital were either able to navigate the system 
or not. We could see how much uh, depends on the knowledge and also familiarity with digital tools. For example, an, an ability to talk to a doctor via a phone to describe your own symptoms when you don't have a, a visual contact with all the cultural taboos in our generations, it is a real challenge. So the first ma months show these um, inequalities and so far there is a tendency that they are deepening. Can they be overcome? The trends that we see, uh, digitization, for example, they are neutral vis-à-vis -vis the inequalities because it all depends how these tools are deployed. If um, we see an implementation, well, that, that, that can be seen clearly uh, in case of vaccination program, when it turns out that the principle of of uh, registration of seniors mm, gives a, a benefit to the groups who have a bigger social and cultural capital, those who are able to register themselves using these various platforms, those living in large cities. And when they didn't see a spot, they were able to find some other place where they were signing up for vaccine, vaccination or they, they, they have a, a family which was familiar with digital techniques. So it shows that if uh, telemedicine tools are implemented, we have to remember that they should uh, take into account these uh, cultural inequalities. Otherwise, they will not be um, uh, equalizing, because the telemedicine can uh, facilitate an access to the consulta consultation to the persons who are living far from uh, large cities. But if it is is not properly implemented, it can deepen the equalities. So the pandemic, uh, it's not a deu ex machina God hand which puts us on the right path. It is up to us how we are going to go about this. And depending on what we do, uh, we will see the impact on inequalities. It's not that we are going uh, not to draw these conclusions because we are operating uh, um, according to a certain um, slogan. Oh my God, Pauls, nothing happened. Somebody I spoke to um, uh, compared it to a football match uh, that when the coach uh, says, uh, well, I think we will be fine, then we are uh, losing, and then the coach says, okay, it's not a problem, we will have another match. And that can be compared to the vaccination. Uh, we are going to have a great vaccination program, we are uh, taking vaccines in front of the cameras, and then it fails, and then the, the so-called coach says, well, nothing happened, let's uh, go forward. What? No. We are not uh, uh, drawing any conclusions. Well, I just wanted to show you a certain communication mechanism. What uh, Dr. Jankowski said, uh, it is quite important that to a certain degree we have to realize that health is an area which is inevitably political, but it should be politics starting with capital P in order to be able to learn from mistakes. And I think that Dr. Modach could uh, support me in order to be able to learn from our mistakes. We need to be able to admit that we've committed them, to make, that we've made them, and then analyze them. It pertains to uh, some uh, mistakes at the level of individual um, uh, health units, but also at the systemic level. So in Poland we see that we are attached, that even if a situation is unprecedented, a situation where Globally, we have this great question mark and it is difficult to respond to it. 
the, the problems to respond to these pandemics are used in a short-term political game. So it is difficult to reach this meta level, which uh, would uh, be conducive for an analysis and, and to draw right conclusions. We haven't learned that yet. And I think without that, it will be very difficult to change uh, in the health care system because it's very complex. And what's more, there is no a simple answer how to fix it. It will be a long-term process which would require a, a tolerance for errors and mistakes in a sense that they will happen, but they need to be spotted very quickly to mend them. But it is impossible to do it in a situation when we see a low level of understanding how the system operates in the first place. And so there is a misunderstanding that uh, for example, if on one page it is written that our hospital is uh, uh, shut down, we don't know whether it's a good news or bad news. That would require the bipartisan agreement because these are socially sensitive issue and they are easy to be politicized. And at the same time, it means that to a certain degree that politicians are not able to make some complex decisions because they are entangled in the politics starting with small p. So the way the system changes uh, depends on, 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 on our um, social skills. And the uh, second thing is about uh, international uh, environment. We've seen that increasingly in our media when we see some uh, vaccination programs. And uh, it is not that Poland needs to do something. The contemporary medicine with the whole network of um, interdependencies at all levels and in every aspect requires an international approach. And we see that uh, in case of uh, vaccines, but also it, it pertains also to the personnel. I would like to uh, come back to Dr. Modach about this uh, political perspective uh, with uh, um, capital P and also what we can expect within uh, coming years by 2023. Well, Maria was right uh, uh, in speaking about policy with uh, capital and, and low case uh, P. Uh, we, we have some um, policies which are drawn by experts, by think tanks, uh, uh, and uh, other um, uh, circles, and uh, they result, uh, and they are showing up also in the ministry. But and they are quite uh, decent. And they, they they are quite uh, good. But then politics, understood as strategy, turns into policy, which is understood and political as as political game. And this confrontation is not working out well because. Uh, later, we are not asking what went wrong, but we are asking who is to blame. We are using this. And when we are um, uh, carrying out such a large transition, which we need to do in the coming years, we are bound to make mistakes. Just as you said, this is uh, a given, this is uh, inevitable, we, will, we are bound to make errors and mistakes and certain groups will try to use it uh, for political gain. To, to achieve certain political or electoral advantage. And uh, under this situation, we need to make a right transition. Let's give an example of uh, uh, hospitals uh, which are undergoing uh, the transition. Uh, the minister, for example, was recently mentioning about concentration of services, uh, transition of hospitals, all these elements were there. And uh, let's take also 
of the financial resources which are to be um, uh, spent. So I, I'm, I will pose a question to all of you. Do you think that in three years we will talk about the transition hospitals or are we going, are, or are we going to show the checks which were shown during the uh, election campaign? Because I think that if this political, uh, the, the atmosphere of pol political game continues, uh, in three years one side will be showing uh, the checks for hospitals uh, uh, in front of the cam uh, in front of the cameras, and the other side will be criticizing it, and we will not uh, see this uh, right emphasis on the transition. So the efficiency, uh, accessibility, uh, quality, elimination of uh, inequalities, which was highlighted by Maria Libura. We are not going to focus on these elements, um, decreasing the difference between the uh, urban and rural areas, which is also another uh, important uh, thing, the situation of doctors uh, in the villages and doctors in the cities. Uh, I'm afraid that in three years we are not going to talk about these important metrics, but uh, we are going to talk uh, how much money was spent and uh, who got the money or which money was absorbed to use this um, bad uh, language about transition, because it's not about the amount of money absorbed by a given hospital or groups or ranges of uh, services, but what is the transition? This should be our discussion about. We are not talking about actual transition. If anybody says uh, anything about transition, no matter whether this is uh, coming from uh, government or opposition circles, this transition is uh, immediately blocked by political language and not substantive uh, discussion. And I have to say that that I uh, also subscribe to, a, to, to the skepticism expressed by Ma Maria Libura, because from the holistic point of view, which requires a great, that the whole system requires great transition, I think we are not learning that. For example, a coordination of uh, the work of, of, of hospitals and who should be uh, managing it, no matter what is the idea which is floated, because first of all we need to show what we have on the table. Before this idea is explained, discussed, uh, we hear that uh, they want to take hospitals away from us. Maybe that this is a, a political idea uh, that they want to take these hospitals away, but uh, uh, we should not uh, ask on, at this level, we should focus on uh, substantive uh, points. So here, I'm quite cautious, just like Maria, I'm, I would like not to say that I'm a pessimist, but I would also share this uh, caution, whether we are learning it. I'm uh, glad uh, that it has been said. Because the discussion around the centralization or the centralization of hospitals shows that that subsequent uh, national uh, discussions uh, are moving towards very shallow man managerism, which means that let's change an owner and, and something should happen, something should uh, improve. We are not thinking about the overall goal or what should be the um, target product, what should be an interaction between a patient and a medical um, facility, but we are using this uh, managerial language uh, which is full of uh, English terms, but it does not guarantee good outcomes. When we take a look at the uh, reforms, uh, even where there was this re-centralization, just like in some Scandic countries recently, it was not aimed at re-centralization, it aimed at improving the quality and efficiency of these hospitals. And it was preceded by a very precise analysis of the processes 
why these hospitals do not fulfill uh, expectations, what's wrong. And then this decentralization did not consist in ownership changes, but uh, on setting certain quality benchmarks, uh, rearranging the hospitals from this uh, inefficient competitiveness towards uh, a rivalry for a result. So the rivalry component was kept, but it was recalibrated in order to uh, achieve the health outcomes. So this is what is missing. And I have a sense that we are not able to uh, escape the curse of the 1990s when many reforms were implemented and some of these reforms uh, were quite deep, were, were, were quite painful. And as a result, it was easy to politicize them and to gain political capital criticizing them. And on the other hand, just because uh, they were did uh, in such a fragmentary way, never uh, done till very end, uh, were partial uh, and they were copied from some other countries so we were trying to copy a, a reform model from a given country and put it uh, implemented in Poland without taking into account local um, conditions. This is too complex a system to do it like that. The fact that it should be incremental and slow is, does not mean that we can uh, give up on setting goals. And by goals, I understand certain population outcomes and, uh, for example, also a quality for the patient. Whereas in Poland, the subsequent reforms are pronounced uh, under the slogan that we are changing the way we manage, uh, we are introducing new institutions without setting a clear goal. Dr. Moldach. I agree partly, but not with everything. Is it not that uh, we need to change the status quo? Because uh, much has been said about the incremental reforms, uh, not to uh, disrupt something, but then we reach a wall and at some point we need to demolish this wall. We need to do it step by step. But this change of status quo is inevitable. But one more thing about planning. Don't you think that these reforms are um, uh, introduced from the uh, wrong end? Instead on first naming the challenges and options that we have, uh, instead of discussing them and hear from the population, what do you think about various uh, solutions? We just uh, centralize hospitals. I think that the response would be completely different. I'm completely convinced if the Minister of Health or the Prime Minister uh, went in front of a camera and said, we are confronting the following challenges. We were talking to experts, so it is uh, documented, we can do it, we can solve it in this, that and that way. This is our green paper, we use a Polish equivalent. What do we think about every solution we would like to ask you what you think. In our opinion, the best is this solution. Let's uh, open consultations. You have six weeks uh, to uh, speak, uh, speak up and then we will return. If we did it like that, I'm sure that response will be completely different. Uh, than the one we saw in case of um, uh, centralization of hospital. I also think that uh, the communication is a big challenge in the uh, public discussion. But is it not uh, both trend and risk that, uh, quite honestly, I don't see, but, well, I would like to, well, maybe I'm, uh, I, I don't see an importance of change, uh, an attempt to civilize this discussion, uh, civilize uh, the way we uh, legislate, we 
often see the further degeneration uh, limiting the possibility and opportunity for, for, for um, uh, consultation. So I was just wondering, could we use some international examples or some achievements from the past, maybe within this, these uh, 30 years of free Poland? There were these processes and reforms which were implemented in a rational way, in a social consensus, and effectively. What do you think? I think that uh, there is a wall between uh, society and the government, the discussions uh, which happened, uh, the expert discussions is that uh, the, the government goes through the secret uh, exit, goes through the wall and listens. It is uh, not very often uh, is, is not showing solutions, it, it just listens, it enables us to uh, unleash certain emotions, uh, it gains some time, then we, uh, we, we finish the discussion, they come back uh, behind the wall, and something happening behind the wall, and then we see a solution, and everyone is surprised, and, and say, we didn't, we were, we were not talking about it, and the government, the, the officials say, we had the consultation, I think this is a disease which has been for years, I think that this large uh, transition of the health system will require a new social deal. When we talk about increased uh, financing, it would need to have some sources. So anyway, we either see a higher health contribution or some other levies just like, for example, uh, sugar tax, which should uh, supplement uh, the national uh, found, uh, national uh, health fund, and it is paid by taxpayers, and this larger reform will require ordering this uh, area, and this um, reluctance to increase uh, taxes or health contribution results from a certain disappoint, dis disappointment over the uh, health system. So this new uh, social deal needs to uh, contain a certain promise, what they will get for the increased contribution. It cannot be done without a social dialogue. I, I like this idea of this new uh, social deal. Of course, this is a huge political challenge, which is very difficult to uh, undertake by any political force. However, it is worthwhile to uh, demand it, to uh, try to achieve it, this new social deal, uh, which would be uh, arrived at in an uh, inclusive way, and at the same time, boldly confronting the challenges. Thank you very much for um, uh, this discussion. Uh, thank you for 60 minutes, and I also invite you to uh, watch uh, uh, further recordings and also I would like to thank the partners of this conference. Thank you.